Welcome this morning to the teaching section of this service. And first of all, I'd like to welcome on board the Badagri Center. You're welcome to the Covenant Nation. It's your first live service with us, and we're looking forward to massive and great things in uh, the city of Badagri. All right. I will, um, um, in the next one month, go out visiting um, different centers um, around the country as the Lord himself wills. All right. So we're getting to the message this morning, and uh, we'll first take a confession uh, this morning. One to go. As I said to listen to the word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto me, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me, this is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I am not distracted by anything or anyone. The word of God is full to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It's oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and the enablement to live out God's will. Amen. All right, this morning we want to continue on what we started all right, last week, and I'll also finish my story about my 75-year-old man, since many people have taken an interest in the story. All right, people said, what happened? What was the conclusion of it? Uh, I remember clearly now the conclusion was, I think we used to run multiple services then, and it came in between one of the services. So after I came down to preach, I actually saw him in the congregation, so he saw me and realized that this was the pastor, all right, and so I preached my heart out for him to understand I'm really anointed and called of God. Amen and amen. And that's how we settled the matter. Amen. All right. Uh, let's go quickly to Psalm 23 and continue our discourse here. And I want to get into something, Psalm 23, verse 1, quickly, please. And I want to get into something, all right, one major thought this morning. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. We saw this last week. I shall not want. It says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And then it tells us that he leads me, this is what Sammy said, beside the still waters. So here he's being led by the good shepherd. Now, as he leads him, he restores his soul and leads him in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, as he has been led by the good shepherd, he said, yea, in other words, yes. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So as you are being led by the Lord, he will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. It is an authentic path there to the place that he has prepared for you. It is a valley of the shadow of death where things are going on that can put fear into your heart. Though he leads me through this, I will not, though I walk through rather the valley, I will fear no evil. In other words, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but no evil is going to come near my dwelling place. I'm not going to attract into my life the evil that the valley is suggesting to me because it is the shadow there of death that wants to scare me and bring about an entrance so opens up a door because it's what you greatly fear that comes into your life. 
And so he wants that door opened up, but he says, I will fear no evil. The reason is, thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then he goes on and says, he has prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That table consists of two things. One, he anoints my head with oil. And I said, when you are going through things, and you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, which is an authentic place to be in, for when Jesus was baptized in the wilderness, the first place that God brought Jesus into was, sorry, was baptized in Jordan. The first place he brought him into was the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness in Luke chapter 4 and verse 1. And the wilderness externally is not a pleasant place to be in. In Luke 4, one place, put it up. It says, being full of the Holy Ghost, they returned from Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had to go through the wilderness to get to the place that he had promised and he had prepared for them a city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Uh, so you pass through things. You are made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that subjected you in the anticipation of something. Uh, so you go through this valley. It's an experience that can create fear on the inside, but what you need is the anointing of God upon your head. God wants to revolutionize your thinking. He wants to bless your mind. He wants to show you things that are possible. He wants you to understand that the way in which you look at things that causes fear is actually the wrong way of looking at things is based on an old mindset. Nothing is impossible to him that believes. There is more to life than your predictable pattern. He wants to, with thoughts this, create new neural pathways through your mind where the light bulb will come on and you will have new discoveries on the inside of yourself where you will be able to confidently tell people that, listen, the very place you want to give up, all right, is the very place where God wants to expand, elevate, and enrich you. Uh, and so the prayer is, many of us start praying on the outside, God, change this, remove me from this, this, do this. What you should pray is anoint my head with oil. If my head is anointed with oil, I guarantee that my cup is going to run over. I'm going to experience an overflow in this place once my head is anointed with oil. Let the Holy Spirit be poured into your mind. Uh, let new brain cells develop on the inside of you. New ways of looking at things. They will open up your mind. Uh, we saw last week with Hagar, she took her son and put him up for death and stood a far way off because she couldn't stand seeing him deteriorate and die before her eyes. But an angel appeared unto her and said, Hagar, what aileth thee? And said, the Lord has heard the voice of the lad where he is. In the face of a situation that looked like it was the end of the road. Her eyes were blessed and her eyes were opened up. And she saw a well of water right in the place. The very place she thought that there was no way out, there was a massive well of water that sustained them. And from that, Ishmael became a great nation. So there is a table he has prepared for you. He wants to anoint your head with oil so you, so, so you can recognize this. Uh, and your cup now begins to run over. Uh, that's why we saw in Job chapter 29 verse 1. 
Job was the wealthiest man in the East. And he now ran into some real severe crisis. And he now continued his parable and said, All that I were as in the months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head, that's what you want. And when by his light I walked through darkness. So I saw a great light there and I walked through that particular situation. So you stand upright as a solid person with what is called possibility thinking. You now have broken into that which is within the veil. You can no longer be trapped by things on the outside. You can think your way out of poverty. You can think your way out, all right, because of the thoughts. Hear what God said. He said, the thoughts that I have for you are thoughts of good and not of evil. Thoughts begin to come as the rain comes down from heaven and waters the ground, mix it. So it says, so shall my word be. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways higher. If my thoughts and ways begin to enter into your mind, your life will appear as a well-watered garden. In the midst there of all the dryness, you will be a well-watered garden that is flourishing. Isaac was there in the land of famine and oil was poured upon Isaac's head. And Isaac understood how to access water and cultivate the ground even when there was no rain. So he was able to plant while other farmers folded their hands and said, based on the history of humanity, when there is farming, there cannot be a harvest. But God blessed the mind of Isaac. Isaac's mind was opened up. This is what you should pray. Don't just seek deliverance, seek the better resurrection. And how do you get to the resurrection? God hath given, it says, I pray that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding will be opened up. You will understand the things you never understood previously. All right? And it says that you might experience the same power that raised up Jesus from the dead. We are beneficiaries of opened understanding. We are able to preach this way and communicate because somebody's understanding was opened up. We have electric power because somebody's understanding was opened up. Doctors can treat people that would have been condemned to die, all right, because the understanding of man was opened up. You walk through your own valley of the shadow of death to have your own understanding opened up. All right? So God doesn't guarantee in no way that you will not have tribulation. In fact, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. He said, but be of good cheer, I have overcome them. And I'm going to open up your understanding. You're not going to remain the same person and experience some external deliverance. I'm going to open up your mind here and bless your head here with oil. And you're going to see things different. Now, I want to get into something. But let's focus on that. And and that's what Paul was praying. He said, let this thing depart. God said, it's not about it departing. It's about making you a better person. It's not about you, all right? I mean, in Psalm 13 and verse 1, or from verse 2, let's start Psalm 13 and verse 2. It talks about how long shall I take counsel in my soul? Having sorrow in my heart, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? All right? Because the blindfold is over the mind. It says, consider and hear me, O Lord. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So open up my eyes. Open up my eyes and I will defeat death. It says there in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. It talks about the fact that I will show you a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That's that sleep of death. He was talking about death. 
It says, but we shall all be changed. In other words, lighten my eyes and I will be a changed person. You come out of the situation changed. You now see things, all right, you almost call it 360 degree vision. You see things and the world in a totally different way now. You see possibilities. You know, there was this um, musician, uh, I won't mention his name, but, you know, a friend was telling me this. His elder brother used to have shows. And he said in the 80s there, this, well, what happened was, um, 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 so he, he's probably saying this, that he, he went to sing, all right, somewhere. He showed that he had. And he came with this sophisticated sound and they threw things at him and stoned him and told him to get off the stage and they were shouting for another uh, musician to come and play and told him, get out, we don't want this person, we want this other person. And the other person had to run up to the stage to save the day so that the show doesn't get spoiled. And this chap, if I call it, this was in the 80s, said he was going to give up on music and go and look for any, some, his, he used his degree. And the gentleman that organized the show told him his own story, how he lost his father at an early age, age of 11. And how his father was a millionaire and they lost it. The whole family collapsed and, and they, he had to now go and start selling newspapers on the street to be able to have an education. Talked about how he will see his friends going to school while he will have to hurry to go and sell newspapers. Well, to cut long story short, he said, see what I've done today. All that I went through while I was young, I have overtaken all of my mates by just this one idea that has come. And he told that man, he said, don't give up on this, all right? You are the musician for the future. You will see. Write what I'm saying down. It didn't take him three years. The man blew up. He had to make certain adjustments. But you see, all of that is for new oil to come on your mind. So you make certain adjustments. But to say that is the end of the road and to give up is the cardinal sin. Don't resist the change. It's you that must change. And once you change, the environment is going to change. And it's going to show you the changes that you ought to make. The Holy Spirit will do that. That's why it says God is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count it slackness. But he's not willing that any should perish, but should come to repentance. Or that word is the same word changed. He said, we shall not all sleep. I show you a mystery, but we shall all be changed. Those who don't die in the valley of the shadow of death are people that subject themselves to change. They allow that process. Companies that don't die, change. Churches that don't die, change. Leaders that don't die, change. Those who refuse to change and go with the predictable patterns of the past fail in the valley of the shadow of death. So you find yourself in that valley of the shadow of death. Something God wants to show you. I want to bring this out. And what you've got to do there is not to say, well, why am I going through this? But to understand that he has prepared a table. Some of you are going through things today. You are in places and going through situations that a year, two years ago, you will never have conceived yourself being here. You may even have lost things that you consider to be support structures, jobs, or things in your life that you felt that I won't have survived without these things in my life. But you are still alive. And it's not about surviving. It's about being enthroned. And what you've got to understand is got to allow the Holy Spirit do his work on the inside. All right? So we go to Romans chapter 8, verse 30, as I build it up to this point. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Next verse. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is God that justifies? Who is he that condemneth? Is Christ that died? Rather, that is risen again, 
who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. Hold it there. What God is telling you here is, you have somebody at the right hand of the, of, 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 at, at his right hand, making intercession for you. Jesus Christ is right there praying. As you see this, as you are watching through the valley of the shadow of death, he is making intercession for you. He is saying that God is for you who can be against you. He says that anybody that lays anything to your charge, he is your defense. He says, who is the person that will condemn you? I am making intercession. I gave up my life and my blood for this particular type of situation for you not just to survive but to excel. As we say, don't fail the hand of Jesus. He is right there making intercession. All he wants from you is this. Let's go on reading this here. He says, all right, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. All he's saying is, believe that I love you. And if you believe in the fact that I love you, I want to show you that my love for you, which is unchanging, is the stabilizing force. If anything is removed and everything goes, my love for you is enough. Jesus said to his disciples, Tonight, you will be offended, all right, and you will all scatter. But the Father, he said, I am not alone. The Father is with me. And this is what God wants you to discover, all right, as you go through that. Yes, you've theoretically spoken about the love of the Father, but he wants you to experience his love for you in that place. He wants you to have a revelation of that love. For, for you to come to know that love and you now depend solely upon the love that God has for you. All right, let's go on then. See this here. and see this. We're going somewhere. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, which means through anything, I will never doubt the love God has for me. Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril of the sword. He went on. For it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day. We are counted as sheep for slaughter. Other people there that are judging, condemning, they look and say, you are sheep for slaughter. This is the end because you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He said, no, leave that scripture. In all these things, which means it is in these things, we are more than conquerors. This is how we show that we are more than conquerors. Not when we are judged by the green pastures or still waters, but when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and men make predictions right there. He says, we are more than conquerors, how? Through him that loved us. Next verse there. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, principalities, powers, nor anything present or anything that shall come. Next verse, nor height or depth, nor any creature, any creature, any creature, shall be able to separate us separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Men can be separated. Anything can be separated from you. But what you cannot be separated from is the love that God has for you in Jesus. And it's this love he wants you to experience. That God with you is a majority. He wants you to experience that love in the midst of all of that. And once you come to know that love and you sing about that love and you begin to worship about that love and you begin to praise that his mercy endureth forever and that God is good and that you are not defining it by what's going on on the outside. God is good and his mercy endureth forever and you are singing, which means that, I put it here, the key to victory is to consent to be loved by God, deeply loved by God when everything seems to be going south. To acknowledge God's love for you and his mercy over your life, even when everything on the outside is falling apart. That's the secret to victory. It says, this is how we are more than conquerors. 
through Jesus Christ. He wants you to understand that love. Now follow him one step to where I'm going to with it. That's why in Isaiah 49, verse 12, you have to get this into your spirit. Behold, these things, these shall come from far. Now God was giving powerful prophetic words and said, this shall come from far. Lo, from the north, from the west, all right, from the land of Sinai. Blessings are going to come. He said, sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, Zion looked around. That's why Jonah said, they that observe lying vanities will forsake the love that God has for them. God wants to show you that that love and intercession of Jesus for you is constant. And that he has allowed you to go through this, all right, in his love for you. You say, I can't understand how it can be in love. How does death represent love? How does, you know, separation from this, how does it represent love? He says, I, listen, let's see this thing through to the end. You come there and worship me. David understood this. His child had just died and they came to tell him. He said, God still loves me. Yes, I experienced judgment, but he went into worship, changed his raiment. Solomon came out of that place. Give God a chance to let the intercession of Jesus appear in your life. Don't judge him by what's going on on the outside or the way people treat you. He said, the Zion said, the Lord has forsaken. Put that scripture. Forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten. Look at how I am. God said in verse 15, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of a womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. It says, I have engraven thee upon the palms of my hands. Your walls are continuously before me. Next thing it says, thy children shall make haste. That's the result will make haste. The destroyers that made the waste will go forth. It says this, lift up your eyes round about. Behold, all these gather themselves and come to thee. In other words, but it says, you have got to acknowledge that I love you. Uh, you've got to sing about that love and sing praises and rejoice in the fact that I love you. And the waters of life will begin to flow out of your belly and stuff will begin to happen on the outside. In other words, give me a month of thanksgiving, praise all right, worshiping and praising me for the love. Just focus on my love. Sing to it. It says, and after some time, you will lift up your eyes and you will see things not just coming, making haste. Which means they'll be running in. The blessings will be coming in. But I want you to know something. That my love for you is unchangeable. And so in concluding, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51, or 52 here. Well, well, 1 Corinthians 15 and, verse 15 and verse 52, please. It says, in a moment, all right, verse 51, rather. It says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, as I experienced that death, but we shall all be changed. Jesus said, there are some walking with me that will never see death. In other words, they get into a situation and it looks like it's all over. He says, they won't see it. They won't enter it. They won't experience it. I will open up their eyes. You move to another level of glory. Next verse there. In a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, the last trump shall sound. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. And he's told us how that happens. So when the corruptible have put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality, then it shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. In other words, you have swallowed up death in victory. Next verse. Listen to what he's saying here. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Then he says, the sting of death is sin. 
All right? In other words, it says, death, you are swallowed up in victory. Because the sting of death is sin. And what he's talking about is, that sting, all right, death, which means you can't have death operating somewhere where sin, all right, is not. The Bible says, through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Now, that sin there are not, are not physical actions you take because a death passed upon all men, which means even those that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam. So it's, it's a nature that comes on the inside. And he says, is that nature that, that's, that death is, is, is the sting of death? Now, I want to show something. Acts chapter 2 and verse 24 before we come back and close. Uh, let's start reading from verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands and crucified and slain. So men did that. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. So when you experience it, you experience pain in that valley. Fine. Because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. So God has loosed the pains of death. Because it is not possible that he should be holding all right of it. Which means that, why was it impossible for death to hold Jesus? Because the sting of death is sin. And since Christ was without sin, Death had nothing. As Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh unto me and he has nothing on the inside of me. So it was impossible for death, all right, to hold him because the sting of death, what death uses, is sin. And once that is not present, death cannot hold. It says it was impossible. Death could not. Death gets swallowed up in victory once that sin isn't there. So what is the conclusion, all right, of this? If it says that the sting of death is sin, Sin, therefore, has to be dealt with, and death will, therefore, have no hold upon a person. So let me show you this in Scripture quickly. Go to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. Let me show you what I'm saying. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now, once the blood is cleansing a person from it, death cannot hold that person. Now, next verse here. It says, but if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if anybody says, look, I'm without sin, all right, then he says you are deceiving yourself. And when you deceive yourself, then Satan comes and he can apply death to your life. Now, when you are going through things, he, can, he will hold as a stronghold because it is something inside you he's using to keep you trapped in that situation. And you're not conscious of it. All right, because you're not conscious that you are doing anything wrong, that's how he held Job. And Job kept saying, look, I've not done anything wrong. I've not done anything wrong. It's because we don't understand the nature of sin. All right. Uh, now, if they go and ask somebody, are you perfect? In, are you perfect? Say, no, I'm not perfect. Also, if you are not perfect, then you know that there are imperfections on the inside. And if there are imperfections on the inside when it comes to your character, your behavior, things on the outside, then you know this is what he's using. And what the Bible is saying is that, look, if you come to Jesus and you get that cleansed from you, it says, through the blood, it says that's why they won, by the blood of Jesus. Right, once you are cleansed, that thing is cleansed, then death says, I have no hold. But once you don't come for cleansing there, then you deceive yourself and you are stuck in that place and you're wondering what is going on. 
So a person who is going to receive this light, this is what I want to show, this real light, and have that anointing upon their head, for he was anointed with the oil of gladness because he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And have that, all right, poured upon his head there, and you'll see that light has to offer up this prayer I'm about to say. And that's how the sting of death is removed, which is sin. And so death no longer can hold you. And we're going to see in this scripture, it cannot hold you. Psalm 32 and verse 1. And this is what I want to show. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Whose sin is covered. Blessed is that man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, this is what's going on in the church. That's why people are going through things. That's why people can't defeat their environment. When I kept silent, my bones waxed all through the roaring all day long. Day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me, and my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin. In other words, you come and say to yourself, the only reason why this thing can have any hold on me is that there's something in my consciousness there that it's using. That's why James said, if a man is tempted, let him not deceive himself and say it is God. He says you are tempted when you are drawn of your own lust and enticed. So let's go on here and he says this. Acknowledge my sin. All right, my iniquity have I not hid. I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. Thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this forgiveness. In other words, the Bible says we have redemption. What is redemption? Forgiveness of sins. That is, a person can be redeemed from any situation. Through the forgiveness of the sins of that person. That's why Jesus will go and say, thy sins are forgiven thee. And people will begin to walk. He says, through that cleansing. It's not that you did anything. The word sin simply means to miss the mark. In other words, there's an intended mark that God has for your life. And you are out of alignment with that. It's, a fun, it's not behavior like that. It's a fundamental thing. He says, you are out of alignment. Now, I want to bring you back into alignment. So it says this, you forgave my sin. It says, for this shall everyone that is godly pray in a time where thou mayest be found. So you discover God. Surely in the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. That is, those floods there will not come. All those things they say, will not come near unto him. The threat in that situation will not come near. But he has to go on his knees in humility and pray there and worship God for his love and say through the blood of Jesus, I have access into the presence of God. Yes, I might be imperfect, but God has accepted me. And he says, come and I will cleanse you with my blood. I have come for cleansing, Father. Let your blood wash me clean of anything here that the enemy may be using to do that. And he goes up to God in prayer about this. He says, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. This is when you begin to rejoice. Now you can start singing with joy. Now verse 8, crucial. I will instruct thee. I will teach thee in the way that you should go. I will guide thee with my own eye. So it says, I will begin to instruct you. I will begin to teach you in the way that you should go. Folks, God just brought me into a body of knowledge in the last three months. That yesterday morning when I was praying, I told myself I could have lived my entire life on this earth without ever coming in contact with this information. And it was buried on the earth in books that are no longer accessible. Massive information about church expression. And I'm telling you, now there's much more God wants me to know. And in the years to come, he will open different bodies of knowledge to me. But this one, 
So I've lived on this earth and said that I'm pastoring a church and, and I'm, I'm building churches and without that body of knowledge, I would have stood before Jesus and looked like a complete fool. So he wants to teach you. He wants to guide you and instruct you. He wants to impart knowledge to you. Show you the areas. That's where the change occurs. When he opens your eyes, that's what he opens your eyes to see. And there is a change. Right? And you experience the love of God. And you enter into it. I know that life is totally different from what I initially thought that it was. That's why he says that. In, 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 in that same scripture there, let's go on in Acts chapter 2 there. Let's get to verse 25. Acts 2 verse 25, it goes on. David speaketh, I foresaw the Lord always before my face is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Verse 26, it goes on. Therefore my heart did rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Why did he do this? Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer the Holy One to see corruption. Next verse, he has made known unto me the ways of life. He taught him there the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. That fullness of joy did not come from outside, but the countenance. That is God who commanded light to shine, had shone into the heart, the light, all right, in the image. It's the, Jesus is the brightness of his glory, all right, the express image of his person and the brightness of his countenance shines forth into your life. I want to pray for every single person going through that valley of the shadow of death at this moment. Intercession has been made by Jesus over your life. The Spirit of God who dwells on the inside of you also has made intercession. Therefore, standing upon the intercession of Jesus, I declare that those doors are optioned up. Light comes forth into your life. You discover the truth concerning the things that God wants you to do. And this year, the table that you shall sit on shall be full of fatness. Out of this you shall come into a season that is void of any form of lack. No form of lack shall exist in your life. You shall experience the love of Jesus in the areas of your finances. Yes, you will enter into that new place where you will pinch yourself, for finances shall no longer be an issue on this earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, a place of ceaseless flow of, of, of resources, and then you can focus all of your energy and your strength to that which concerns the kingdom of God, for the means through which you will leave your days on this earth are opened up unto you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right, um, just two announcements quickly. Uh, first of all, the first announcement, let me say there's a community groups are now opened, all right? Uh, please um, endeavor to join one of the community groups. And if you are going through an experience, these are groups that capture every experience that any member of this church is having. So you can, all right, get into some fellowship group concerning that particular thing, your vision, what you're going through, whether you're working, whether different levels in your career or starting a business, uh, doing a tech startup, whatever it is, where in the di diaspora, uh, you, you know, you just moved into diaspora, you, different experiences are captured there. And then you can interact with people, all right? And the Bible says two are better than one, okay? One will put a thousand, two. You multiply wisdom when you sit with people, right, who are pursuing the same goals and everybody brings their resources to the table, and, and massive stuff happens in the name of Jesus. So it's opened up, all right, and, and go register 
uh, other websites there, the community groups website, or you can look at the handle there on, on, on Instagram and join one of the community groups this Sunday. Also, I have been informed that um, the exercise for PVCs, which is to be able to vote, I think should come to an end this week. All right? It's your civic responsibility to vote. I'm going to do a series on Christians, politics, and governance and teach on it. Yes, voting is the lowest form of expression of democratic power, but it's essential to it there. So you have to, all right, vote for the candidate of your choice, okay? And some of the most important candidates they start, all right, at council, at, at local government, and Christians should get, all right, involved and participate in this. I'm going to teach on it for young people, showing practical ways in which you can plug into the system, all right, and get things done. All right? God bless you all. We start our teaching, five-day teaching, all right, this on Monday, 6.15 a.m. to 6.45 a.m. And then next week from Monday, that's next week, so this, the 6th, uh, 7th, 14th, we started teaching 7th, and then on the 14th, we have 21 days of prophetic utterances. I'm going to show how we're going to do it, all right? Okay, it's a different style now. I believe it will be more effective in getting things into people's lives. 21 days on healing, productivity of your hands, different facets of human endeavor. God laid on my heart's favor also to integrate it within your life. God bless you all, and have a wonderful week in his presence.